Hi, it's Thursday, May the 16th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Luke's gospel. And today we're in Luke chapter 20, verses 9 to 19. We started the chapter uh, with, with uh, Pharisees, elders, church leaders, uh, excuse me, temple leaders, um, asking Jesus about his authority. On whose authority does he do all the things that he does? And Jesus countered with a question about John the Baptist and if his baptism was of God or of man. And when the Pharisees and scribes wouldn't answer, he said, I'm not answering either. We wondered about that yesterday. And uh, now we continue. Luke 20, 9 to 19. Jesus began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and leased it to tenants and went to another country for a long time. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants in order that they might give him his share of the produce of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Next, he sent another slave. That one also they beat and insulted and sent away empty-handed. And he sent still a third. This one also they wounded and threw out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, Well, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they discussed it among themselves and said, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy these tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this, they said, Heaven forbid. But he looked at them and said, What then does this text mean? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the scribes and chief priests realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to lay hands on him at that very hour, but, but they feared the people. There we go. Luke presenting what is for me a harsh Jesus. Um, a parable that Luke has put into the narrative and in a sense um, decoded it for us right when the when the uh, when the scribes and chief priests realized he had told this parable against them um, so basically we now know this is against them and then you read it in that light and you go oh okay clearly we know what's going on here um, well, to begin with, I don't think you can use a parable against anybody. It's not a direct instruction. It's not a fable with a moral. Uh, it is an invitation to wonder, to seek deeper meaning based on your experience, your feelings about it. Yeah, there's some broad themes that we might all agree on, but not always. And I mean, it's very easy to read this the way Luke is suggesting it be read. Absolutely. And, and in fact, that is the easiest way to read it. Um, especially when we have Jesus talking about it. And again, who heard Jesus talking about this parable specifically? See, it, it occurs to me again that, that there were a, there's a, be a collection of sayings and parables that Jesus used because we they're, they're memorable. It's why you use a parable. It's why you, you know, have clever little um, stories to tell or, or, or adages um, because it, it gives that kind of wisdom handles. You can carry them around. You remember them, right? So uh, stitch in time saves nine. No, won't forget that. It rhymes. Um, what does it mean? Well, we can talk, discuss that. Uh, so, yeah, I think Luke remembers a, a parable, but I think he takes a parable that he remembers and he puts it into a story that he may or may not be witness to or may or may not have credible witnesses to. But it might just be a story that he wants told. Um, and, and so, whether again, whether it happened or not, there's a point to be made by the story and he wants to make that. Which is to say that the temple, first century Judaism, first century Jerusalem, are wrong. <laughs> They've got it wrong. Um, so if indeed Luke's gospel is is being shared with people who are now being oppressed and part of uh, um, Rome's destruction of, of, of Jerusalem, the tear down of the temple, um, all of that, then hearing stories that remind us that yeah, 
those people are wrong. They're wrong. The authorities are wrong. The empire is wrong. Um, the Pharisees are wrong because they're after us. The Rome is wrong because they're after. If if we if we you know that that plays well, and so we're going to interpret it that way. Is there another way to interpret the same parable? Um, I mean, I, I, for me, the parable without the commentary, I guess, would be a man planted a vineyard and leased it to tenants, went to another country for a long time. And when the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants in order they might give his share of the produce of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty handed. He sent another slave that they also beat him and insulted him and sent him away empty handed. And still a third, and this one also, they, they wounded and threw out. And the owner of the vineyard said, what will I do? I, I can send my son. Perhaps they'll respect him. But the tenants saw him. They discussed it among themselves and said, this is the heir. Let us kill him so the inheritance may be ours. And so they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. There's your parable. Now comes the question, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Well, then why did you tell me a parable? Just tell me now. God's coming to wipe you people out because you are unfair. You uh, take too much for granted. You are ungrateful. You're all these things. That's what's going to happen to you. But no, we, told, we were told a parable. So take out the what it means uh, words and we get to look at it ourselves. Well, yeah, when I hear beloved son, naturally I'm thinking about Jesus. It would require Jesus to be speaking about himself quite prophetically. Okay, I, 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 I can do that. Um, but what if it is simply that here is a story uh, about making a deal. And um, being increasingly unhappy with the deal. Taking it for granted. Right, a man planted a vineyard. So, so this is this is a business, and he leased it to tenants. And okay, listen, I got this vineyard here. I planted it on my land. If you work it and give me some of the produce, okay, some of the grapes, some of the wine, whatever's produced, some of, some of that, uh, then what remains is yours. No talk about whether it's a fair deal, a generous deal, or a horrible deal. I don't know whether the, whether the uh, the landowner, uh, the man who owns the vineyard, I don't know whether he gets 20% of the produce or 80% of the produce, it's a 50-50 split. I don't know any of those things. Just know that there was a deal in place and the tenants were glad to have it. And then the man went away. Out of sight, out of mind. So glad to have this deal with you. But, you know, once you're gone and I'm not seeing you and thinking about you, I begin to grumble says he sent one of his workers to the tenants that uh, that they could pay their bill pay what's owed uh, give him his share of the produce of the vineyard not not more than not give me everything just give me what we agreed on and no they've decided oh this is ours we're here So I, I'm invited, you know, myself to start to think about when I get, when I start to take things for granted. Get a good deal, seems like a good deal. I'm happy with the deal. Um, and then after I've lived into the deal for a little while, I just, you know what, I'm, I'm starting to get ripped off here. You know, there's people in a vineyard over there, they're only paying 15% and I'm paying 20. I'm getting ripped off. This isn't fair. Um... I was happy with 20 originally, but now that I'm starting to compare, or maybe I haven't heard what anyone else is getting, I just feel like I'm doing all this work. And, and I'm doing all this work, and, I, and I'm still giving 20 cents of every dollar to somebody I don't even see. That's not fair. How often do I hear people sit around and complain about taxes and how high they are and why it's unfair that they should be taxed? Uh, and we say those things as we justify paying cash to beat the tax, get a better deal, um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, we're filling out our income tax, I mean, well, you know, and then fudging the numbers a little bit because why should I be giving them? It doesn't seem fair. Although, we had a deal. 
right? We we had a deal, uh, and and we like the things that, that that the taxes produce for us. We sometimes forget about them, but you know we want to have a military. We want to have a police force. We want to have hospitals. We do want to have teachers. Oh my God, the roads are horrible. Oh well, we want good roads. I don't want to pay more taxes, but we want good roads. We want a, a regulated. A uh, country where 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 minorities can feel um, safe, right? And and everybody has an opportunity to grow and thrive, and that costs money. And we say, that, yeah, no, we get. Of course, that costs money. No, no, you know what? I'll gladly give it that first year, and within each increasing year, I, I don't want it now. I'm just less and less interested. And what happens is 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 that continues to grow and grow every year it gets a little worse to the point where I'm beating up that worker, that person who comes to collect the money. I'm beating that one up and probably beating them up even harder. And then the landowner sends the one that's beloved to him, sends his own son, and I kill him. I kill him. The point is... It, it gets increased. I, I, I become increasingly detached from my gratitude. I was glad to have that deal originally. Very glad to have it. Um, and, and, <laughs> yeah, so uh, what happens though is that I just become selfish. And instead of, now, if I had focused on my gratitude, I perhaps wouldn't be. Instead of focusing on how hard it is to work the land, and this was a hard year. Boy, I could use that whole dollar, but I only get 80 cents of it. Oh, man. Because there aren't as many dollars as there were last year, because it's been a tough year. Um, I don't say to myself, oh, thank you, it was a tough year, but, but I, I don't have to pay the landowner as much. No, I, st I still got to pay him 20 cents on every dollar, and it's just... I need every dollar I get. Uh, so I, 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 I no longer think about the gratitude. I only think about how hard it is on me. And I become so selfish that I could even put myself in a position where I might kill. And by the way, kill irrationally. Let us kill the heir so the inheritance may be ours. How does that work? I mean, if the tax assessor comes to my house and I kill them, that doesn't mean I don't have taxes anymore. <laughs> right? It doesn't mean I can live tax-free. That's not how that works. Um, so for me, this can become to be, it can, can be a story about, about what happens when I lose track of gratitude. This could be a story to me about what happens when I lose my integrity. And integrity and gratitude seem to actually be tied in for me. The more grateful I am for what I have, the more integrity I have. The less likely I am to cheat and steal, break the rules. Um, cheating and stealing is really easy if you figure that the world is out to get you. You don't owe them anything because they're not good to you. Um, so why not? And I know people who do exactly that. And I... I'd like to tell you that I am without, that I, that that's never happened to me, but that would be a lie. I'm not going to enumerate times that it's happened, but there are moments when perhaps I have not followed the exact line that I should have, knowing full well, but being angry because you know what? They owe me. They owe me. Um, so I've lost track of my gratitude. I'm focused solely on myself. And those are the moments when I have no integrity. Those are the moments I don't want to tell you about because I am ashamed. This parable works on that level for me. If I want to imagine that the man who planted the vineyard is God, the other thing that I can I can I can see in this story for me, um, revealed by that idea, if we if we kill the son, then then we get everything. Basically, that means that the vineyard owner doesn't exist. He's dead. I can also live in the world as if God is dead. And it doesn't seem like a big deal at first. And then it becomes a bit of a bigger deal. And a bit of a bigger deal. And then I can start to believe the world is out to get me. And pretty soon I am doing things that I would never have done before. 
it's interesting for me being aware of God's presence in the world, of God's love for me, um, makes me a better person, makes me more humane. I'm a better man knowing that there is God. This parable shows me what happens when I imagine that God actually might be dead. I become a person I wouldn't want to be. I can get that out of the parable. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that's what the parable means. The parable means something different every time we read it. Luke has put it into the middle of the story to tell us a thing. Uh, and, and, then, and then Luke has gone on to tell us, yes, so, so God is the owner of the vineyard. Jesus is clearly the son. And of course, if you read this, you know, after the, after the resurrect, after the crucifixion, um, in resurrection, then it has a different meaning. And of course, that's when this gospel is shared. Uh, so whether Jesus would have said those words, I don't know, but Luke wants those words there. So Luke's going to put them there. And he says that, um, and the people, oh, heaven forbid. I mean, what's going to happen? Well, the owner's going to come and he's going to kill him. Owner's going to get vengeance. Heaven forbid. And then, and then Luke has Jesus quoting um, Isaiah. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So again, for Christians in the know, um, Christians 40 years after Jesus has been crucified, Christians a little bit later even, as, as this gospel comes to, uh, comes to be written, uh, would know, yes, that Jesus is the cornerstone uh, and, 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 and was rejected. Absolutely. At the time that this would have been, that this event would have taken place, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Well, the builders haven't rejected Jesus yet. They've questioned him, right? The Pharisees, uh, the scribes, they've questioned him. They've wondered about him. Some of them are definitely against him, but many of them are also very much for him. So that rejection hasn't happened yet. That rejection has happened. When we're looking back 50 years later, 60 years later, whatever it may be, um, 40 is a good number. Um, it ha it'll, it's happened then, but it hasn't happened at this moment yet. We're still sort of working it through. And then we go on a little further. Everyone who falls in that stone will be broken to bits and it'll crush on anyone on whom it falls. What we've just described there is stoning. So stoning, for many of us, stoning is what we saw like in Monty Python's Life of Brian. Uh, men, um, or Monty Python women sometimes dressed as men, but men basically taking stones and pillorying somebody with them, okay? Throwing rocks on somebody, uh, stones, rocks, and, and, uh, and yeah, beating them that way to death. That is one kind. Uh, another kind of, of, of stoning is to take someone to the edge of a cliff, throw them over. They land on the rocks below, and that is their stoning. Uh, and then you might even push another rock that would land on them and crush them. That's also stoning. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. That's stoning. It will crush anyone on whom it falls. There comes the stone landing on it again, or again, just the pillory. What we've described here, Jesus describes, is stoning. Which, of course, did happen in first century Jerusalem. It was a way of dealing with blasphemers. So Jesus could well be saying to the Pharisees and the scribes, there'll come a time when you're gonna realize that by not recognizing me for who I am, you have committed blasphemy. I don't know that it's saying that everybody who doesn't understand is going to be crushed by Jesus when he comes back. Of course, Jesus is talking. He hasn't even left yet. Um, I don't think that that's what this is, but I think this is, it can be a reminder to people that, that it is a blasphemy. Now, the Pharisees and scribes would say it was a blasphemy for people to say that Jesus was the Son of God. And what Jesus is saying to them is, actually, the greater blasphemy is you don't recognize that I am stone the builders rejected to become the cornerstone so there's the punishment i don't think he's threatening the punishment as much as pointing out that 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 what they're doing is actually blasphemy 
And see, I think Jesus takes, I think that Luke takes this event, and I think there is a confrontation between between Jesus and, and the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, and I think he inserts a parable that he knows in it and then makes an effort to connect it. Um, and of course, then we end up also with the same theme. When they heard this and thought it was against them, again, you don't use a parable as a weapon. Uh, so that's not consistent with Jesus at all. But nevertheless, um, they they wanted to lay hands on him at that hour. I mean, they wanted to arrest him now. And we know some of them wanted to kill him. But they still feared the people. People were still supportive. So we're still exactly where we were when we were reading yesterday. Um, the the religious authorities, some of them, the ones who are calling the shots these days, they are afraid of the crowd. Otherwise, they'd have taken care of Jesus a lot faster. But they're trying to navigate that. And that has this message all on its own. But I think the parable might have a message too when we pull it out of Luke's translation of it, Luke's understanding of it. I don't know. Maybe I'm onto something, maybe I'm not. I'm going to leave it with you and see if you can get onto something. So let me offer a prayer. Loving God, oh God, thank you. Thank you for the relief that comes when we begin to hear your word. Thank you for the opportunity to wonder, to be part of creating that space where your word emerges. As we hear your voice, as we experience your word, may we be drawn to you. May we grow in faith. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, that's enough for me today, but I look forward to seeing you tomorrow until I get to see you. God bless. Oh, you know what that means, right? To be blessed means that God sees you exactly as you are, knows you exactly as you are, doesn't doesn't need you to be better or worse than you are. Knows you exactly as you are. And God's love comes to you, embraces you in, in your moment. But God's love also moves through you into the world and helps to change the world. God's love moves through you in such a way that you, you can grow from where you are right now. You can heal. You can be made whole. You can forgive. You can be forgiven. All of those things. Um, that's the power of God's love. And as I say... It moves through you, literally, into the world. So God bless you. Thank you for being you. See you tomorrow.